All right, everybody, this is Ross. In today's video, I have finalized my 2020 garden plans. And uh, I want to talk to you guys about how everything's going to be laid out, the varieties I'm going to grow, and then, of course, why it's so important to plan. Um, as I do every year, and we've been talking about the garden plans, I've been asking for your assistance as we've, as time has gone on here these last couple months. What do you guys want to grow? Uh, what are you planning to grow? Uh, what do you think I should grow, etc. And uh, we've just been harping on the point that it's just so important to plan. Um, it's really simple to do this in Excel, map this whole thing out, uh, measure out your beds, you know exactly how much space you can work with. And then from there, you just plug in whatever you want to grow. Um, and then that way in the spring, you know exactly where everything goes. In uh, the winter time, when you're starting seeds, you know exactly how many seeds you need to start, when you need to start them. I mean, this can get as intricate as you want. Um, this year we have two garden beds, only two garden beds at home. Uh, we've really planted a, one of our garden beds with figs. Um, and then we had another garden bed that never really did all that well. Um, because of the location and what I had planted in it. It was just a giant mess, but that one we turned in also into perennials. Um, so we're now down to two. One is a, um, a cold frame that we've talked about very recently. And then we have also signed up and we got into a community garden um, that some of my best friends, their mothers are a part of. And so I'm gonna be gardening with them this summer. Um, but this is a 30 by 30 plot that I've acquired and we'll be able to grow in. And we've talked about that plot and what, I, what I'm going to be expecting and trying to brainstorm different ideas. You can go back and watch that video if you're interested. But we finally, I think, have like really hammered this in and really um, figured out what I'm going to grow and where I'm going to grow it. Um, I did go a little crazy, but I've realized that even 30 by 30 isn't the most amount of space. It is a ton of space. It's easily 10 times more space than I've ever had. That's a lot of square feet, but um, for things like melons and squash and watermelons, corn, these things take up so much room that I would really like to have even more space than this. So maybe next year, I can do a double plot if I wanted, um, but uh, I'll tell you right now, we figured it out. We've got everything in here, squeezed in, everything I sort of wanted to grow, we got it, and then some. Um, so let's start out here with the the beds at home really quickly. Uh, a couple points I wanna make. We've got some sugar cane that's perennialized in this bed here. This is our south facing bed where it gets a lot of heat and a lot of sun. This is probably the best spot in the yard for things that like the heat. We've got herbs, things that I'm, I'm gonna wanna pick quite frequently, like arugula as well, mizuna in the summer. We have our national uh, pickling cucumber. This is just a cucumber that I picked up last year, never tried it, figured it'd be worth a try for something that is, um, is a decent pickling cucumber. We do make my own, I do make my own pickles here with my great grandfather's recipe. I've shared that with you guys on social media, um, on Instagram and uh, and Facebook. But uh, it'd be nice to have my own pickle or my own cucumber grown in my own garden to then use in the pickles. Otherwise, I have to go out and buy Kirby's, which are not too expensive. But uh, I'm sure I can have a better quality pickle if I grow the cucumber myself, right? Um, some other big points here is that we've got some tomatoes that I'm gonna be picking quite frequently, uh, like the big beef steaks, the smaller size tomatoes here, like the black cherry is a, a cherry sized tomato. Um, these are more of like a salad type tomato. The green zebra is an incredible green tomato, really quite different. The garden peach I've heard a lot of good things about. This is the one that we've never tried before and the only tomato that I'm experimenting with this year that's new. Otherwise, we have three pink brandy wines that is just incredible. And I would recommend uh, that you guys get the Suddeth strain 
of pink brandy wine, wherever this is here. So yeah, you can get this on the Seed Savers Exchange. This is the strain of pink brandy wine that a lot of people say is the best. I've always grown this one from day one, and I've never tried any other type uh, of pink brandy wine or any other brandy wine for that matter. This is an incredible, incredible tomato that is my absolute favorite. It is incredible, as I've said <laughs> twice, or th this is the third time. So um, <clears throat> highly, highly recommend it, guys. Uh, then we've also got in our, our cold frame here, which extends from this section here. Uh, we've got things like broccoli and bok choy in the summer. Um, peas, the sugar snap peas are going to go in there. What we have is the sugar and variety. This is it right here. This is, I can't say that this is the best sugar snap pea, but it's incredible, guys. It really is. It doesn't get all that tall, and it's very early. It also seems pretty productive as well. You don't need to support them, as that's definitely for sure. Um, you kind of just plant them very densely together, and they grow in like a clump. And they all get their own little space. I even do two seeds per hole, two seeds per cell in the uh, the cells that we start indoors. I start them indoors. Then we transplant them out. And I even space them very close, like four inches apart. So, uh, you know, they're, they're just a very densely packed crop that I love. I, this is like my favorite garden vegetable of all time. And it is the sugar and variety. I am kind of, I would be very reluctant to try any other type of pea, guys, just because of how good those are. We're also going to do in the summer some soybeans, the Chiba Green variety that I really think is super productive. That is an incredible uh, soybean that's great for edamame. Also, we're doing the Kalima bean, and the Kalima bean is a French bean that is uh, incredibly good. You can eat this raw. It's one of the better garden snacks that you can just snack on in the summer. Um, you can also cook with them, but I don't think you really need to. I would say you pick them, you can eat them raw, but if you're gonna cook them, I would even just say lightly cook them with some olive oil, some salt, maybe some garlic, or some kind of acidity with it, and that's it, just very lightly uh, get them sauteed or something and then you're good. You don't need to cook them for a very long time at all. Uh, then we've also got some Brussels sprouts and we have a very early variety that we're doing called Hestia. I would also highly recommend the uh, flower sprouts if anyone's interested from Johnny's. The flower sprout variety of Brussels sprouts, it's slightly different. It's like a, a Brussels sprout that's a that's kale. It's like a kale they call them. They're incredible. Um, when you cook them, it's better than cooking a Brussels sprout because they've got all these other like different nooks and crannies that you can add like flavor to um, as you cook them. It's way uh, they're way better than regular old Brussels sprouts. But I haven't found them to be easier to grow or to get them to work here. Uh, although I've only done them, I think one or two seasons. The garlic is quite um, densely packed in here, and it's music. That's the variety that we're growing, music. It's a bit too late to do music here because you have to overwinter it. The great thing about these hard neck garlics that you plant in northern zones or colder places is that they will put up a, a scape. The scapes are one of the best uh, treats that you can have in your garden. It's probably up there with things like, um, it's probably just as good as like asparagus in the spring, um, maybe even better. I mean, it's slightly different, but they really are an incredible treat uh, that I highly recommend. So onto the community garden, this is pretty simple now, how this is all laid out. So I've got it all even on a downhill slope because I, I specifically, um, had talked to one of my best friend's moms and she told me that the the plot is actually on a slope and it's better if you plant um, certain crops higher up versus on the down slope. Um, and she was telling me that she struggled with certain things and other things did well and you know uh, she was just giving me some tips because I definitely want to know what the scoop is with this plot before I just dive in head first in this thing. Um, 
you know, also I have to kind of consider the orientation of the sun and also the orientation of the door, the way that I come into the plot. So that's going to be a little bit tricky and it may change just slightly with that knowledge there uh, with those two things and how that may change this, uh, you know, the orientation of it. But for the most part, we're, we're planting downhill. Um, so the things I want higher up on the plot, as I was told, is that the peppers just really struggle at this plot for some reason. There's a disease in the soil. I forget what it's called. Is it some kind of black fungus? Uh, um, I'm forgetting the name, but basically I was told if I'm going to do peppers, have to plant them high on higher ground. So I may even consider digging around and, and building up a mound to plant them in as well in addition to having them on the highest point of the plot. Um, so the some of the peppers I'm going to grow, like things like the ghost pepper and the habanero is for mainly uh, mainly hot sauce. And then also the jalapenos there are for salsa um, or for cooking in any way that I would like to. We have the Jimmy Nardello and the Carmen pepper, which um, we have them right here. This is the Jimmy Nardello. These two peppers just do so well here compared to all other peppers. They are very productive, um, especially this Jimmy Nardello really puts out a lot of peppers for peppers in general just do not do well here because we don't have the length of our season and we don't have enough heat. So I really recommend if you're going to grow peppers, really do plant them on a mound. Give them as enough, enough soil temperatures as you can, but also pay attention to these varieties, guys. Uh, the Jimmy Nardello is far and away above a lot of these other peppers I've tried. The bell peppers just <laughs> kind of a waste of time here. Um, so, uh, yeah, this one's incredible. Even if you direct seed it, it will fruit for you, which is kind of nuts. Uh, usually you have to start them indoors and get them off to a great start. Otherwise, it's like a wash. But uh, the Jimmy Nardello does so well. The Carmen pepper... The Jimmy Nardello, by the way, we're, this is going to be more of like a preserving pepper that I do where we're going to preserve them in olive oil and garlic or olive oil and vinegar. Um, this The carbon pepper is going to be for cooking and for stuffing and for grilling, all kinds of different uses in the kitchen, uh, not for preserving. This one does also pretty well for a larger pepper. It's got probably the best flavor that I've ever tried in a pepper, uh, in a sweet pepper, I should say. Uh, yeah, definitely a big fan of this guy. Highly recommend it. Uh, let's see here. So we're also doing the patty pan squash. This is a different type of squash, like the scallop squash. It's similar to zucchini in the way it grows, but um, it's a different type of squash, different type of zucchini. And they're probably what I'm gonna be using to stuff with the most. Uh, r rather than the, the Carmen pepper. Uh, or maybe I'll do like a mix of both. Who knows? The Happy Rich. Um, I almost forgot that I was growing Happy Rich, but Happy Rich is a really good type of rapini or broccoli rob. They, they sell it at Johnny's. It's a hybrid. Uh, I guess they actually, it says right here, they have seed crop failure. So that's a shame. I do have myself, I think, some seeds left, if I'm not mistaken. But this guy is really quite something uh, in terms of getting those really vigorous uh, shoots to come up. You know, normally broccoli puts out a head, uh, but on the Happy Rich, if you harvest the, uh, the main shoot off and you kind of tip it or pinch it like we do our figs and other plants, it then starts to send out side shoots. That's really how you have to grow these things. This one puts out really good crop, a really good crop of side shoots. I've really been impressed with it. It's also very flavorful, easy to cook. It's really wonderful. Uh, I'm a big fan. It's really a lot like broccoli though and not like broccoli rob because broccoli rob is pretty bitter um, and I like that bitterness, but this is not really bitter if I remember correctly. Um, We've also got the swallow eggplant here, which I've heard also is probably going to struggle because I'm growing potatoes and that beetle that affects the potatoes also affects the eggplants. And therefore, I'm probably going to have some issues with the eggplants at some point in the season. I probably can get away with it 
with the potatoes, but not the eggplants. Um, so who knows if these are going to be a success, but I, I particularly chose this variety because it says here that if, if there's one eggplant you can grow in a colder part of the world, this would be it. So that is the ideal scenario for every type of warm loving crop like nightshades that you can hope for. You know, the eggplants, I put them just in the same category as the peppers. They're so, so difficult to get them to work here because we just don't have that heat. We don't have that length in our season. Uh, the orange banana tomato, this is the best tomato I've come across for sauce. And Amy Goldman in her book that I read, The Heirloom Tomato, she loves this one. And uh, she couldn't believe that an orange tomato would make such good sauce, but it does. It's incredible. Um, now we've also picked up this ground cherry. This is the new Hanover. We talked about this in an earlier video that we did and how this would be an interesting ground cherry to try because it may just be better tasting than other ground cherry varieties. So uh, this one's won some tasting trials, different things like that. So I figure this would be great to try this but I really want to make these into jam. So we'll have some for fresh tasting, see how that goes, but specifically to make a lot of those into jam. Excuse me guys, I'm a little sick today. <clears throat> We've also got the fennel. And the fennel is just a, uh, a nice crop that I think everyone should, should really consider growing. It's Kind of like an onion, but it's got that licorice flavor to it, a little bit more of a, a different complexity to it. Um, it's really worth growing and cooking with, I think. I think it's wonderful, not just for the bulbs, but also for the leaves and for the seeds. I mean, everything about it is, uh, is great. Um, yeah, big fan of that. We've also decided to grow the Island Creek bean here, Island Creek Annie bean. This is the a bean that I've heard is like one of the best for a dry bean um, with superb flavor here. Uh, you know, I don't know. We'll see. I'm I really wanted to find a bean that would turn into a dry bean that I could cook throughout the winter time, and then you know, boil you know, boil it overnight or. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, soak it overnight and then kind of cook it the next day. Um, and that would be like one of the best dry beans that you could have. But I don't know if that's really true. It's just what I've heard. We'll see. It is a bush bean unusually. Uh, there's also the dragon tongue bean, which is really highly touted by um, Baker Creek. You know, it's apparently a tasty shell bean as well. So who knows, maybe we could uh, have it like that as well. But I'll be interested to see how these compare to my Kalima bean that I'm growing at the house because the Kalima bean is just out of this world good. Best string bean I've ever had by far, but similar. Um, so we'll see what happens there. We've also got things like radishes and beets and carrots and turnips. The carrots are the mochum variety here. Among uh, market gardeners, it's really a favorite. Uh, it's supposed to be very, very sweet. One of the sweeter carrots. I think it's a great, great carrot. I, uh, I enjoy it. There's also the Hakurai turnip, which is really the standard turnip for flavor. It really is. This isn't. This is a really accurate statement here, and we've also got the French breakfast radish, which I think is actually better than the Hakurai turnip. Very easy to grow, just like the Hakurai turnip. Even all year, it seems like uh, they're very, very tasty. I I eat these mo um, raw. I don't even cook them, but this is the stuff here that we are going to be preserving in some fashion uh, this this upcoming spring. Is what we'll do is we'll we're gonna preserve most of this uh, we've also got the onions I'm not entirely sure what varieties of onions we're gonna do I did get my onion seeds to germinate above me but not a lot of them um, so we're gonna have to order more seed for sure um, I may even I definitely want to find a storage onion for sure because that's the whole goal with this is to store many of them I do have the Walla Wallas 
that are germinating above, uh, but those don't store very long. We also have the potatoes, and these are going to be storage, hopefully good for storage. The Yukon Gold Potato we have in pretty mass quantity uh, on order that I got very cheaply. So we have some seed potato coming in, and that's why I'm growing Yukon Gold this year is because it just was so affordable. Otherwise, I would stick with the German Butterball every day of the year. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful potato. We've also got the uh, the noodle bean, this like Chinese red noodle bean that, uh, if I can find it here, here it is, that Baker Creek is a big fan of. Apparently it's unique. It's They have these long pods, they're attractive, they're very tasty. Uh, I don't know, but they're supposed to be quite good. I'm interested to find out never had a noodle bean like this never cooked with them I want to see how all these beans kind of compare to each other because we've also got corn down here and we're doing like a three sisters planting where we've got corn squash and beans and I have the Hidatsa shield bean that we are basically going to try as well never tried this one never grown it don't know much about it I do know that uh, Native Americans use this bean specifically um, in their three sisters plantings. So this is probably a good one to go with, right? It's a pole bean, it's gonna climb. The noodle bean also climbs, and the noodle bean's kind of you know along the, uh, the fence here, along the exterior edge, that all of this will kind of be trellised on. And that way I don't really have to build a trellis for all of this. Um, and I can kind of make more space, get more beans out of this whole thing, and really trial a bunch of different beans. I think that was sort of one little thought I had this year of things I wanted to grow and trial and see what I could do, and and uh, I'm excited to see how it all plays out. Um, so we've got, in terms of corn, a variety called Silver Queen. This is the old heirloom standard of corn, highly regarded by many corn farmers as the one of the tastiest and one of the most reliable uh, corn varieties you can grow. And then I've also got here melons. So we've got musk melons, the uh, Sarah's Choice. This is a hybrid that we picked up from Johnny's. And then we've also got Savor. This is a Charente type, a cantaloupe. That's also a hybrid. And the reason I chose these hybrids is because they're very uh, disease resistant. Fusarium wilt and the, um, uh, what's the other one? The mildew, powdery mildew. So I specifically wanted to, for that reason, grow these it's just disease resistant as I could while trying to maintain some level of flavor in these melons. And then we've also got the, the Blacktown Mountain, which is the best, probably the best watermelon for people in Northern climates. And then we also splurged a little bit and went with the orange glow watermelon, which is supposed to be the, like the best tasting watermelon with the orange flesh should have a different flavor. People love it. Um, and then the last last but not least, we've got some room for squash to kind of go in between the corn rows and take up some space underneath the corn and cover the ground. And uh, I hope it all works out. You know, I hope all this three sisters thing works out. I hope um, there's enough light in here for the squash. I don't know what squash just yet, but we've got things like butternuts. I think I'm going to do... The kabocha squash is probably a big favorite of mine that I should do. And then we've also considered the uh, the spaghetti squash and uh, there's one other that I'm, the delicata I think is the other one that we could do as well. So I think for sure one of these will be a, uh, a butternut, but I'd be pretty, I think I'd be pretty foolish not to grow the kabocha squash as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm super excited, guys. I don't know about you, but this is all looking great. Uh, you've, we've got room in between these rows, areas to walk, even have walkways around the exterior. Not everything's up against the, uh, the fence. Um, I think it all really works out pretty well. We've got things that, particularly the corn that wants the water down the, on the downslope, 
But these melons and these squash, certainly at least the melons for sure, don't want all this water. We're going to have to build them up onto a mound so that uh, we can try to get these guys off of some wet areas, especially if that's the case. Um, you know, I won't really know. I won't really know until I get on the plot. But um, yeah, it's just something that we're gonna have to pay attention to for these melons and these cantaloupes and things like that. Um, and some of this stuff, I'm really strongly considering covering with mesh. It, I did find out that I could indeed cover this with mesh. Um, things like the potatoes and the happy rich potentially. Um, maybe the eggplants and that's kind of why I have these two together the potatoes are obviously in their own little thing uh, whatever kind of needs some protection I probably should pl I should plant next to each other so that I can very easily easily uh, put some mesh over the uh, the row um, and I also want to mesh this whole th really this whole area right here uh, about these this just to cover as much of the melons as I can and keep all that cucumber beetle away if it is if it does exist because it is gonna carry that fusarium will and even though they are resistant that's a big way I think to lose a part of my uh, my melons this year is if I don't protect them or they don't have some sort of disease resistance so uh, who knows? We'll have to see how it all plays out. But yeah, I'm excited. I think you guys should do some planning if you haven't. Check out these varieties again. The new Hanover ground, ground cherry, swallow eggplant, happy rich, the carbon pepper, Jimmy Nardello, orange banana, Island Creek Annie, the dragon tongue bean, Kalima bean, mochum, Hakurai turnip, the French breakfast radish, Chinese red noodle bean, Hidatsa shield bean, orange glow, and the sugar and snap pea, and of course the pink brandy wine. Probably my favorite of the summer vegetables. We will, uh, well, maybe I guess it's technically a fruit, right, guys? Someone's going to call me out. But anyway, we'll talk to everybody soon. I want to thank you guys here for watching this one. Check us out on Fig Boss, Instagram, and Facebook. We'll see everybody soon. Um, yeah, I can't wait to show you guys the plots. Take care.